So as Mike outlined, I'm going to talk about digital transformation, and I'm going to make a bold statement that I know you're interested in this. And I know because I've had literally 20 conversations scheduled with you yesterday and today. So that is my proof to back up my statement that I am 100% certain that there's a lot of interest in this topic. And what I'm going to do is not spend time trying to justify that it is interesting. I'm going to ask you to buy into that from the start. But what I am going to do is spend time saying, if we assume digital transformation is happening, then what would we do if we were in your shoes? So this is a way to show you our perspective on looking at the tools that are emerging and how to use them in the right way. So first, I'm going to actually use basketball as a metaphor, an analogy for the digital transformation, and you'll see why in a second. Next, I'm going to show you the perspective of looking at digital as a set of tools in an emerging toolbox and really having a fine comb way of looking at those technologies and assessing them and understanding how they fit into your business. And finally, we're going to look at how do you actually take these tools and implement them in a way that keeps you competitive, so helps you survive, or at least helps you grow. And so this is really an imperative. It's not just about an opportunity. It's also about survival. So how many of you know who this is? All right, pretty good, uh, more than I thought. So, uh, so this is Stephen Curry. So he is a two-time MVP on the Golden State Warriors, and he is actually really driven, he, he's really a poster child for the transformation that has happened in basketball. And that's namely, for a short primer on basketball, it's namely that he's really shown the power of the three-point shot. So if you've never seen basketball, have no idea what I'm talking about, in basketball, you take a ball, you put it in a hoop, and you get points for it, right? If you're inside the arc, you get two points. If you're outside the arc, you get three points. And to simplify this tremendously, analytics has found that three points are worth more than two points. <laughs> and so there's a big push to enhance uh, the amount of three-pointers that you shoot. And so what does the evidence show? Well, if you look at basketball, and this is plotting the three-point attempts per 100 field goal attempts, so just telling you how many three-pointers people are shooting over time, starting in 1980 all the way through, through uh, about 2015. And what you see is a very steady rise in the number of three-pointers shot. So really, the three-pointer has become an important weapon or tool for basketball teams. There's a little blip in here that that actual peak is because they moved the line in. So that's why there's a peak there. So the question is, Everybody appears to know in the league that three-pointers are an important tool that could help them be successful. So has this been borne out? Has this closed the gap, perhaps, and leveled the playing field between the best teams and the worst teams? And the answer is no. So what I'm showing here on the y-axis is offensive rating, which is really a measure of efficiency. How many points do I score each time I have the ball, more or less? Higher, the better. On the bottom is the rankings of the teams in terms of offense. So the best teams are over here on the left, and the worst teams are over there on the right. And I plotted two years for you, 2006 and 2017. And what you can see, in 2006, firstly, the line is below the line from 2017, meaning there has been an improvement overall in efficiency. But there's a question about whether this has improved competitiveness. So have the, best, have the worst teams come closer to the best teams? And the answer is no, the gap has actually widened. So what I have here in the text here is that it went from 10.8 points per 100 possessions to 12.4. Basically, the gap between the best and the worst got bigger. So just knowing that there was an important weapon that they had and using it more did not lead to competitive balance. And so bring this back to digital transformation. Digital has its own tool set, and it has its own versions of the three-pointer. And these are things that, you know, this is not an exhaustive list, but if you look at things like artificial intelligence, robotics, the Internet of Things, et cetera. And what we know is there's general agreement, the, the qualitative trend on this graph. We can quibble about how fast and all that stuff. This is obviously just saying that adoption of these technologies is going to increase. So great. Does that mean we all win? Absolutely not. So just as in basketball, Following the trend does not guarantee success. 
and what I'm going to spend the rest of this presentation on is the fact that the companies that are going to win in digital transformation don't just need to know that these tools are important. They need to understand how the tools work and how they're evolving, and they have to know how to use them correctly. And that's what we're going to do the rest of this talk. So now let's talk about the digital tool set. How do we as Lux look at the tools that you could actually deploy in your business? It's not exhaustive, but I want to walk you through a few examples. OK, back to this toolbox. OK, AI, robotics, blockchain. Raise your hand if your CEO has asked you about blockchain. Not yet? They will. Mine has. So the first stop through the toolbox is going to be in artificial intelligence and in specifically natural language processing. So you might ask, how is NLP relevant to your business? Well, there's a lot of ways NLP can be relevant. It can be a tremendously useful part of your AI approach, and that's to understand internal and external documents. It can be for generating dialogue, like all the rage behind chatbots that you've probably seen. It can even gauge customer sentiment and emotion. And if you ask yourself, well, where is NLP really impacting life today? It's actually, impl it's actually being implemented and impacting your life every day, because I'm assuming you use Google. And if you do, you know that there's some algorithm that tells you which results are going to bubble to the top. That's powered by PageRank, and that's it's really in part powered by NLP. Another example on the chatbot side is Lufthansa, which is developing, which has developed a chatbot to interact with its customers and ask, answer commonly asked questions. Okay, so what about a more B2B application? Well, the, the French oil and gas giant Total is actually working with an NLP company, Sinqua, to actually understand internal documents, patents, and other documents that are in their system to try and bring order and try and extract insight from all of the disparate knowledge that they have in their business. So there's really a lot of ways that NLP may potentially impact your business. So what we decided to do, my colleague, uh, Cosmin Laszlo is in the audience, decided to build an NLP experiment. So how do you, build, how do you test the efficacy of these engines? Right? We're not Google, but we do want to see if it can solve the problems that we're interested in. So what we did is we selected 10 articles from 10 different sources across a range of Lux coverage areas, some of which we talked about this week. Energy storage, advanced materials. And we took these 10 articles and we fed it into publicly available NLP engines. Microsoft has one, IBM with their Alchemy API, Google. Um, you can do it yourself and build it through Python with NLTK, a company called Cortical. So we tested seven, I think I left out one. And so we fed the raw text of these documents into these engines, each one, same experiment. And we grouped the results that come out by the entities that they identify, the actions that occur in the article, and any taxonomy findings about specific things relevant to those coverage areas. And then we did it manually. We had an analyst look at it and assess who was involved, what happened, and other important metrics. And so then we compared them and we devised a way to rank and compare them all. So we measured the efficacy of the engine for accuracy, basically how well did it identify those entities and the actions. But we also tested it for consistency. So article to article, what is the variance of that accuracy? And what do you find? Well, we found, perhaps not shockingly, that Google bubbled to the top in this, in this particular experiment. Um, you can see through the results that others that are fairly high profile, like IBM and Microsoft, didn't fare as well. Google fared quite well in both accuracy in terms of matching what the analyst found, but also consistency from article to article. Okay? So this is an example of really assessing what, not just that a tool is important, but assessing which one's best for the problem you're trying to solve. Next, next example in the toolbox is robots. And specifically, there's a really interesting problem that Amazon actually has a competition for, which is the deployment of robotics in warehouses to help with the picking problem and packing problem. This is an extremely difficult problem. And what it raised to us is that it's not so much at this point will robots replace humans, which I know is what you're going to read about and there's tons of articles about. But really, first, it's about the question of whether it makes sense to replace a human versus help the human. So is it man 
plus machine or is it man versus machine? So an example of the way we look at this is essentially a, a qualitative graph of really this, this range of assisting humans through replacing humans and how we think that's gonna evolve over time. And qualitatively, we think that this market, from a technical standpoint, it makes much more sense to help humans first. And that's because of difficulties with navigation, difficulties with object manipulation, and real solid technical problems that could be overcome, but we're not close to yet. So this is qualitative. The other thing to do is look inside the space and who are the companies that are attacking along the spectrum. So by this logic, there's companies like Gray Orange and ClearPath that we think in the near term, you're going to see more traction for initially. That doesn't mean they're better than all the other solutions, but it does mean you have to be realistic about the timeline at which these solutions will work. We go up the scale, there's companies like IAM Robotics and Fetch Robotics, and then even more extreme in terms of really displacing the human in Via Robotics and Magazina. So again, it's important to understand the trend and to understand the players that are involved in solving this problem. So the, the last portion of this section, I'm gonna talk about blockchain. So you, you can't open the newspaper these days without reading about blockchain. There's a lot of confusion. We've gotten questions like, when, when can I start selling blockchain? Well, you probably won't, because that doesn't really make sense. But to go back into what is blockchain, it's really a distributed ledger system. It's a way of recording data. And data, not shockingly, is stored in blocks. And the first successful deployment was through Bitcoin, which is by far the most prevalent deployment of Bit uh, blockchain. But what it is is an encrypted database which allows for a large number of nodes to all have the same set of data on them. That means every node in the system has to converge to the same set of data. So each block includes all the recent transactions and then what they call a proof of work. So that proof of work, which is called a hash, is passed on to the next block and so on and so on as depicted here. So what that means is each block is literally connected to the block before it and the block after it. And if you combine that with the fact that all the nodes must converge to that same set of data, this is actually really hard to hack. This is one of the reasons why it's a very interesting solution. So there's a prohibitively high cost to really rewrite or alter transactions. If you alter the blockchain on one node, all the other ones immediately identify that there's a discrepancy and so that's why it's really hard to hack. So there's numerous uh, developers that are building blockchain solutions for things outside of just FinTech or for currency. Um, and I'm gonna give an example of that in a second. So what's so special about blockchain, to add to that a little bit, a little bit more color. Developers are drawn to blockchain due to decentralization. So really think of Bitcoin as displacing banks. Simultaneously being publicly open letting many people into the ecosystem, but also allowing them to preserve their anonymity. Because of the, the fact that all the nodes have to converge, like I talked about on the previous slide, this is inherently secure, and it maintains data integrity. And then, to add to that, obviously with Bitcoin as an, as an example, you're able to embed currencies into the system. So what that does for more of a, if you think about supply chain, which is an example I'm gonna talk about, you allows, it allows embedding smart contract functionality into the system. Okay, so these are some of the benefits to deploying blockchain. So what's an example of this? Well, Brigand Cotton streamlined a shipment of cotton from Texas to China using SKU Chain, which has a distributed ledger solution for supply chain specifically. And they used blockchain, they used smart contracts and IoT, lots of hot buzzwords. What did they do on the blockchain side? Wells Fargo and ComBank of Australia, of Australia were able to develop a letter of credit. This may seem arcane, but basically that requires physical documentation and can take quite a bit of time. This was essentially a fully digitized. And they did it using a distributed ledger, again, built by SKUChain. The IoT portion of this, this is really interesting. They basically were able to track the shipment and trigger the smart contract when the shipment arrived at its destination. So you've got confirmation that, that the item got from point A to point B, and you triggered payment all in one swoop. So it's really an example of taking what can be a very onerous process in terms of supply chain and streamlining it via blockchain. 
So what I've done here is picked a few examples, but I picked them on purpose because they really demonstrate a few things. First, the question you ask about the tool is, which one's best? And that's the experiment we did on the NLP side. How are the tools evolving? That's the warehouse robotics example. Over time, how do I expect capabilities to change and who's doing it? And finally, with the skew chain and the cotton examples, great, I know how the tools work. How do I actually use them? And so we got to look for case studies where there's actual deployment. So finally, one of, this is the part where it's really about putting ourselves in your shoes and thinking tactically about, OK, we know digital tools are important, gave you a way to look at them. Now what do I do? How do I build a structure that enables us to do this efficiently? And obviously, you could talk for days about this. This is at a high level, you know, what we're seeing and what we think are smart approaches. So to go back to the basketball analogy, winning teams have the right players. So this is actually an updated slide from our chief research officer who gave a talk last year, where he actually observed that there's this emergence of new positions at a lot of the corporations, including yours, that are really focused on digital, digital innovation, digital transformation, et cetera. So you see digital appearing in the roles at the VP level, at the director level, uh, even at the senior executive level. And this is happening not just in the usual suspects like IBM, for example, or Amazon, that's maybe obvious, but also more physical industries like oil and gas, chemicals and materials, um, even gases, right? So there's a really increasing understanding that you need to build the right team to have ownership. But if you just slap digital on someone's title, does that mean you actually have power to enable change? Not necessarily. So we need new titles and functions. They need to be dynamic. They need to be able to move from business line to business line or from process function to process function and actually make a difference. You need to be able to build teams across function. You gotta be able to work with the product. You gotta be able to work with IT. You've gotta be able to work with marketing and HR. And they really, this is really critical, if there's real buy-in from your executives, they have to be empowered to actually make change. Otherwise, a business unit that's heads down trying to get quarter to quarter performance is never gonna think this far forward in terms of how digital is gonna impact their business. So you have to be realistic about actually enabling this to happen. So go back, now we have, a, let's say we have a team. We did step one. Now we need to segment the enterprise. How do I actually look at my organization and break it into parts? And the first one is product. And these are very simple questions, but they help get you started down the right path. What do you sell? You sell a widget, you sell equipment, you sell chemicals, you sell software as a service, even maybe you sell energy, your utility. Kind of a very simple question. You guys know the answer to this, but it's a starting point. What do I sell? And then it's looking into that toolbox and saying, can digital technologies and tools make my product smarter or better? Can it, beyond that, create new products or services, or both? And then, from a competitive standpoint, in the hands of others, do digital technologies threaten me? The other way is to look inwards, look internally. What keeps your business running day to day? What actually keeps the machine turning? IT, HR, supply chain, marketing. This is more about the process. It's about business process. And there you're going to ask a different set of questions. Can digital tools make my people smarter, faster, safer? Can a lower cost, can it increase efficiency? So you're really, it, you're asking a different uh, set of questions, but you're looking at the same set of tools. So we can look at examples from process and product and first look at this really digital done wrong. So most of you have probably re recall the big hack of Target in 2013. So the, the hackers actually got access to all of the chain's US registers, every single one. So how did this happen? Well, firstly, they installed advanced HVAC systems. This is sensible, right? They operate many retail stores and they want to save energy. It makes a lot of sense. So there's no, there's no harm and no foul in that. But they installed it on the same network as all their point of sale solutions. 
Now, some people will tell you that's just the way it's done, but from an outside observer's perspective, that's crazy. And what happened? Hack occurred through the HVAC vendor. Got access to every single register. Net result is 40 million people had their credit and debit card data exposed. Okay, so very real consequences to taking a technology, deploying it, and just missing completely the gaps in your solution. So what was the fallout? Besides bad publicity, a federal judge mandated, mandated what seems relatively small, a $10 million um, fund set aside for hack victims. It also forced them to designate a chief information security officer, because they didn't obviously they didn't trust them with their current process to do it themselves. So this goes to show you digital technology is even done by an experienced large corporation can have disastrous effects if you do it wrong. What about the product side? I really want to emphasize this point. A lot of companies out there are amateurs when it comes to digital, and that's okay, but they have to be aware of it. So this is an example of the appliance maker Miele encountering a very significant security flaw in one of its commercial connected dishwashers. So what happened, what happened with this? They released a commercial dishwasher with networking capability. Okay, a security researcher discovered a flaw, a backdoor in which you could easily access a local network and extract data. So, being a good citizen of kind, the researcher informed the company about the bug and about the security flaw, received no response. So, in, in response to that, he took it public. So you read articles about it. So that'll force them to respond, obviously. But this is really something to encounter. We can talk about IoT making things smart and deploying things and building services, but we're really in a dangerous phase where companies that really lack the expertise to do this are trying to, to wing it, and they don't even have systems to report bugs. So what we're doing is essentially creating a bunch of attack services. So the, you really have to think through having the right partner with the right expertise. If you're gonna go digital, you're gonna go smart, think through these different things. On the product side, it's not just about technology, it's about business model as well. So this is an example from the robotics world. Hi Robotics. they don't even make a robot. They provide a platform by which you can essentially get one when you need one. So if you need it for X hours, pay for X hours of robot use. Uh, it's really coming to the idea of a robot as a service. This totally turns on its head the current industrial robotics market, right? You pay hundreds of thousands, if not millions, to install. You take months to train and program. This is saying, just hire the robot for a few hours if that's what you need. Similar in business models, a company we've covered called Automated Technologies. They make a very low cost robotic arm. And they charge a monthly fee. And the idea is, it only has a thousand, thousands of hours of lifetime. But when those thousands of hours are up, take it, toss it on a pile, pick up a new one, slap it on, and hit go. So it's really, again, turning on its head the idea of how we think about the CapEx and the deployment of something like robotics. On the process side, you have to be careful. Your vendors are gonna tell you they've solved every problem and that they've, they've helped you before and they can help you again. Not necessarily untrue, but you can't necessarily just take their word for it. So I give you an example from a study we did. This was all prompted by me reading an article that's the, the headline that you see right there. GE and PTC form a broad strategic alliance to pursue brilliant factory opportunity. Seems relatively mundane. We see partnerships in this space all the time. What's the big deal? Well, on the surface, this was curious to me because on the one hand, PTC and GE seem to have competing platforms. They're both aiming to create an end-to-end -end IoT platform. So why would they partner? And so we dug into it, and we poked around some of the customers, we poked around the stack with the actual vendor. And I'm not gonna ask you to read this, but basically we developed a framework for looking at a full IoT platform from sensing all the way through action. And if you look at all the items in red, that's all areas of overlap between the two solutions. So that meant one thing, that meant there's actually gaps in the predict solution that had to be filled by another vendor. And that's fine. But if you read the marketing, 
<laughs> Obviously, Predix was hyped as this ready-to-go machine that could, that could be dropped into any business right now. But we know from talking to customers that's not the case. And that's why you see a shift in strategy where now they're acquiring companies, as Mike Holman talked about, like Bits do, trying to fill in those gaps. And so this isn't to say GE won't be formidable. Of course they will. <laughs> but it does mean you have to be careful about what vendors are presenting to you and be critical about how they're, the state of their solutions are right now. So to close. You really have to take all these things and put the pieces together. What do you do now? You built a team. You have to launch initiatives to assess new features, new products and services, and new processes. Somebody has to actually be asking these questions. What should we be doing? Someone has to challenge the way you do things now. That has to be someone's job. Assess the tools, trends, and state of the art. This goes back to digging into the toolbox. How does it work? What's the status? Who's doing it? How do I use it? Having a team that actually is dedicated to understanding that. Logical question. Do you buy or do you build? Of course, there's going to be situations where it makes sense for you to build from scratch. But increasingly, there's a lot of solutions out there. So is, you know, one of the main questions is, is the solution you need already out there? Probably. You should probably be looking for it before you go ahead and invest and build it yourself. And finally, when you partner, you start small before going big. This is logical. This is how you probably do things anyways. But pilots and joint development with companies like startups, uh, other corporates, you know, preferred vendors, it's really piloting these things in your supply chain, in your IT. Wherever you, need, you see an opportunity to innovate, you have to try. And then when you scale, that's when you're going to possibly acquiring a company that you like who's demonstrated something or working with acquired or vetted startups or, of course, those corporates I talked about. So finally, I want to close. This is maybe a bit of a downer, but everyone can't win. This is a true statement. I think everybody would agree with this. So McKinsey did an interesting survey about the return on investment for digital uh, initiatives. So the y-axis here is return on investment. and. The x-axis is the percent of respondents to this survey. So there was a few thousand respondents. And basically, if you look where I'm circling, only a very small fraction of all the respondents saw outsized return on investment on their digital initiatives. Okay? Some saw negative. So it goes to show you it, it really takes a lot more than just knowing a trend is happening. It's knowing how to do it right. And I'll come back to basketball. It's the same thing. You know the three-pointer is important. It doesn't lift all the teams back to even playing ground. Some of them win, some of them lose. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks.